You're going to be looking for four things whenever you have a discussion with an unbeliever. When you get into an apologetical encounter or dispute with an unbeliever, there are four things in particular you're going to be looking for. And I'm going to speak of each one. Um, <coughs> First of all, you'll be looking for prejudicial, prejudicial, where we talk here, prejudicial conjectures. Put it very simply, you want to be on the lookout for arbitrariness in what the unbeliever is arguing. One of the two great intellectual sins that men commit, no matter what field of study you're in, is arbitrariness. The other one is inconsistency. No one is allowed to be arbitrary if you're trying to present a rational basis for what you believe. And no one is being rational and presenting a basis for what they believe if they contradict themselves, if they're inconsistent. And so arbitrariness is something you need to be on the lookout for. Believe it or not, I don't know if I could justify this statistic, but subjectively it seems to me probably 80% of your work in apologetics is taken care of if you'll just be on the lookout for people saying anything they want to say. 80% of what the unbeliever ends up doing turns out to be totally unfounded giving of his own opinion, to which you should say, so what? So that's your opinion. Now why do you believe that? It distresses me to see um, Christians get into apologetical debates with unbelievers, and when they're going back and forth, the unbeliever is pressing the Christian for a reason for this and a reason for that, and when the Christian gives answers back, the unbeliever, you know, parries them off with this or that opinion, and we just say, oh, what do we do now? Well, you should press the unbeliever for some reason for the way in which he's responding to the evidence. He cannot, she cannot, may not be, if you're going to be rational, arbitrary. Believe me, this is the biggest problem in, in witnessing to people, is that they think they have the right to just believe whatever they want when it comes to religion. They can just be arbitrary. But if you want to get into an apologetical dispute, as I indicated in our earliest lectures, that assumes that people are seeking to be rational and seeking the objective truth. They're seeking to be rational as they seek the objective truth. And it's not a sign of rationality to be arbitrary, just to believe anything you wish. And a version of arbitrariness is found in the conjectures which are completely arbitrary or unfounded um, or prejudicial, as I've set up on the board, on the part of the unbeliever. One sometimes finds unbelievers, both educated and uneducated, who take offense against Christianity before they're familiar with what they're talking about. And in the place of honest research and assessment of the available evidence concerning some aspect of the Bible, many unbelievers simply substitute personal conjecture for what seems likely to them in the place of argumentation and reasoning. For instance, since the Bible was supposed to be written so many years ago, it just seems likely to many unbelievers that we cannot trust the text of the Bible which we have in our hands today. Surely, they'll say, scribes have altered and supplemented the original text so that we can't be sure that what we have in front of us is actually what Moses or Jeremiah or John or Paul said. For all we know, what we read in our Bibles came from the pen of some kind of monk in the Dark Ages. I've actually had people say that. We don't know if that's what the original said. I mean, some monk in the Middle Ages may have said that. Now that kind of ignorant criticism seems intellectually sophisticated to many unbelievers. After all, in our natural human experience, often messages get garbled or distorted are augmented in the process of being passed from one person to another, right? We've all lived in nice big families where a message goes from one hand to another and by the time you get it, it it's not really in its pure form. So we see, since we've seen that happen in our natural experience, 
we should just take for granted that that's got to be true about the Bible as well. To unbelievers who reason this way, we mustn't tire of pointing out that they are relying upon conjecture and not upon research in what they are saying. Now, it may seem likely that the biblical text would no longer be reliable, no longer be authentic after all these years. But the likelihood, that judgment of likelihood, is an evaluation that rests upon presuppositions that are arbitrary, presuppositions that are nothing more but prejudice. Let's see if we can see the prejudice in this line of reasoning. If you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, what do you say to that? That seems so reasonable. So you should be asking the unbeliever, what's the basis for your saying that? The first prejudice is the assumption that the biblical text is no different from any other written document, which we find in our natural human experience throughout history. Notice how I sucked you into this. I said, we all know what it's like to live in a home where a message is passed from one person to another, and it doesn't turn out to be accurate. It's distorted by the time a person finally gets it. What is it? I mean, I didn't put a red flag out there and say, watch out now. And this is what the unbeliever is going to do to you, not by malice, although sometimes. But the unbeliever doesn't realize he or she is doing this too. You notice what the prejudice is there? The prejudice is this book is like what? Any other book. This message passed down through the ages is like any other message passed down through the ages. But what if it happens to be a unique message? What if it happens to have a unique authority? What if it happens to have the absolute, personal, all-providential, all-controlling, all-knowing God behind it? You see, if that is true, then you can't treat it like any other kind of message, can you? To assume that, in my experience, all other messages tend to be corrupted when they're passed from one person to another. Therefore, it's true of this book as well, is to say this book's like no other book. I mean, is exactly like the other books, rather than being a unique book in my experience. If the Bible is, as it claims to be, the inspired word of Almighty God, then the history of its textual transmission may very well be quite different from other human documents since God would have ordained that its text be preserved with greater integrity than that of ordinary books. Okay, so that's the first indication of prejudice. And that was unargued, right? The unbeliever didn't come in and say, now the book is not as it claims to be a unique book under the providential care of God. The second indication of prejudice is that the unbeliever does not offer any concrete evidence that some medieval monk tampered with the text before us today. When unbelievers say things like that, the remark is simply and arbitrarily advanced as a hypothesis to be endorsed for its likelihood, given your assumptions and prejudices, rather than endorsed because of its empirical credentials. If we want to play that way, of course, we could, we could with equal arbitrariness, conjecture that the words which came down to us as Paul's were actually written not years later than Paul, but were written years before the time of Paul. Arbitrariness is a fickle friend to the scholar. Cut loose from any demand for evidence, we could believe any number of conflicting things. The point here is the unbeliever has thought he or she could just say, well, it just seems like common sense to me, and arbitrarily say that. Thirdly, as an indication of prejudice in this criticism, we see that the unbeliever has not taken account of the actual evidence which is publicly available regarding the text of Scripture. My second criticism was they didn't think they needed evidence at all. My third criticism, or indication of prejudice, is that there is a great deal of evidence there and they haven't bothered to even look at it. If the critic had taken time to look into the subject, he or she would not have offered the outlandish evaluation of the biblical text as being unreliable. Uh, this, um, this fact came home to me with uh, great strength or force after I took an advanced course in graduate school on the philosophy of Plato. 
In this course, we were required to do textual criticism of the literary corpus of Plato's works. <laughs> so let me just, I know you're not fascinated by Plato necessarily, but let me use this as an illustration for you. Our earliest known manuscript, our earliest extant manuscript of a work by Plato dates from right before 900 AD. It's the manuscript known as Oxford B, and it was found in a Potmos monastery by E.B. Clark. Now you have to remember that Plato is thought to have written these manuscripts roughly 350 years before Christ. And the first copy we have of these manuscripts written 350 years before Christ dates from 900, or just before 900 AD. And so there you have a gap between the original writing and the earliest document we have as a copy of 1,200 years. By contrast, the earliest fragments of the New Testament date less than 50 years after the original writing, the earliest fragments. The bulk of our important extant manuscripts date from 200 to 300 years after the original composition. And the text of the New Testament, which we have, is remarkably uniform and well-established. And the reliability of the Old Testament text has been demonstrated to the surprise of scholars by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but it's a fascinating field if you want to pursue it more. Some estimates given by scholars who have studied painstakingly the, um, the different manuscripts of the New Testament and the testimony that we have from literary evidence uh, leads them to conclude that the text of the New Testament has been established with certainty in about 98% of the cases of the words and lines of the New Testament. Now then, <clears throat> we have a person who says, how can you be sure what the Bible says? Maybe some medieval monk wrote all this stuff. Well, we know that a medieval monk didn't make any of this stuff up or in those outlandish cases where we have a medieval monk altering the text in some fabulous way, that's not in our current Bibles just because we have so much manuscript evidence that shows that that doesn't belong there. The overall authenticity and accuracy of the biblical text is well known to scholars. Frederick Kenyon concluded, and let me give you a quote, the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation, that he holds in it the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. And those kinds of assessments from competent scholars could be easily multiplied. And so when somebody says, well, you can't be sure that you've really got the text of the New Testament, you need to point out to them that they're engaging in prejudice. They're not reasoning here. They're just being arbitrary. They're being arbitrary because, in the first place, they've assumed without argument that the Bible's not what it claims to be. <clears throat> A unique text, divinely inspired and providentially preserved. They have not bothered to look at the evidence. They're not offering. This is completely spun out of their imagination. And thirdly, the evidence that we do have would not lead to the conclusion or the radical skepticism that they are proposing. Many times, unbelievers are just so hostile to the Christian faith that they're willing to propose anything for argument's sake, even though they haven't got a shred of evidence to support it. I've even heard some people now, the radical opinion, we don't have any literary historical basis for believing that Jesus of Nazareth actually ever lived. We don't. What is the New Testament, for crying out loud, if it's not literary evidence of the life of Jesus? Well, but of course, at that point, the unbeliever wants to say, but I don't want to accept the New Testament. You say, oh yeah, that's the very thing that we're arguing about, right? And so the unbeliever is begging the question, showing his or her prejudice as much as I'm showing my commitment, pre-commitment to the New Testament. People sometimes think they can just openly dismiss the Bible as a source of historical information, which is, as a matter of fact, contrary to the general practice even of unbelieving historians of the ancient world. 
Unbelieving historians have learned better than to just ignore completely. Now, I'm not talking about people being willing to accept every jot and tittle of the Bible. What I'm saying is the general attitude of scholarship is not to say the Bible gives us no evidence. There are some people, and they are very, very few, who will say, well, the New Testament is there, and it does talk about a man, Jesus of Nazareth. But it may well be that there was no such person, Jesus of Nazareth. This was just made up later as a way of accounting for the origin of the Christian church. Well, after all, the Romans made up a story of Romulus and Remus to account for the founding of the city of Rome. Why can't we just put the Bible in the same category? Well, how about this? If there's an 800-year gap between the founding of Rome and the first stories of Romulus and Remus, if I have the numbers right, and there is no such gap in terms of the life of Jesus and the founding of the church. Jesus is said to have been born about 30 to 33 years before the founding of the church. You don't have an analogy there at all. If there was no Jesus of Nazareth and the church, as we know, came about in the 30s or 40s of the first century, how do you account for the fact that no one stood up and said, what do you mean Jesus of Nazareth? There's no Jesus anywhere. You guys are making this up. The presence of hostile critics of Christianity in the days of the founding of the church makes preposterous the claim that the church came about and just made up a story about Jesus to account for its founding. Moreover, there's the evidence of secular historians, like the Roman historian Tacitus, who refers to one whose name was Christus, who he says suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Christus suffered at the hands of Pontius Pilate. That's a Roman historian who says that. Granted, he doesn't give us a lot of information. I'm not trying to you know, do a complete life of Jesus from this. But to say that Christians just made this up is ignorant, prejudicial conjecture. There was a time when critics of the Old Testament ridiculed the Old Testament for mentioning a tribe of people known as the Hittites. At that time, the Hittites were not known outside the Bible. The Bible was the only literary source, the only um, basis for believing in the Hittites. And since it was the only one, those who were critical of the Bible were quick to say, obviously, this was made up. Until Carchemish was discovered by archaeologists in the year 1871. And now in the last 100 plus years, the Hittites have come to be the best known and studied ancient people outside of the Jews. It's just incredible. Archaeology has over and over again proved to be the enemy of the biblical critics. Because what it unearths is their own prejudices. <laughs> over and over again, what it confirms is the accuracy of the historical particulars of the Bible. <coughs> H.M. Orlinsky wrote, More and more, the older view that the biblical data were suspect and even likely to be false unless corroborated by extra-biblical facts is giving way to one which holds that by and large the biblical accounts are more likely to be true than false. Now, I'm not talking about an attitude that matches what we would say. I mean, it's more likely true than false. is certainly not Christian commitment, is it? But on the other hand, when an unbeliever says, ah, oh, well, historians don't take the Bible seriously, I'm saying, you haven't read the historians, have you? Even they are saying it's more likely to be true than it is false. Think about an unsympathetic umpire like Time Magazine. In an article written in 1976 entitled, How True is the Bible?, the article says, after more than two centuries of facing the heaviest scientific guns that could be brought to bear, the Bible has survived and is perhaps better for the siege. Even on the critics' own terms, historical fact, the scriptures seem more acceptable now than they did when the rationalists began the attack. End of quote. Now all I'm getting at here, very simply, is that when you're defending <coughs> the faith, and unbelievers start throwing out, you know, these opinions, you need to capture them and they're being opinionated. And they start just spinning out from the web of their imagination what common sense would seem to say. You need to say, you know, you're just spinning that out of your imagination. You haven't really studied this, have you? And you may not say it in the tone of voice that's cutting as I am right now, but you need to say, you really don't know what you're talking about. The biblical text is not something to be embarrassed about. 
Historical facts, archaeological confirmation, not something to be embarrassed about. Let's contrast two things here. I am not saying we have evidence for every bit of the biblical text. We have evidence from archaeology or history for every claim made in the Bible. That's not the point. The point is when someone says, well, we can be real flippant and not regard the biblical text or not take the history that's recounted in the Bible seriously. and say, well, that's just not what scholars have learned. And so where is this coming from if it's not really based on scholarship? It's coming from prejudicial conjecture. It's arbitrariness. It's an opinion which may be desirable to the unbeliever, may be useful for preserving uh, the unbeliever's autonomy and hatred of the Bible, but it isn't argumentation. It isn't reasoning. And you need to, as I said, probably 80% of the time that you're doing apologetics, just keep pointing that out. <clears throat> when I debated Edward Tabish at uh, UC Davis, he spent a good deal of his uh, time in his positive presentations in the debate ridiculing the Christian doctrine of hell. <clears throat> he found it preposterous that God would have a barbecue pit for those who would not pray in the right way. He comes from a Jewish background, and that's a reference to not praying in Jesus' name. And so on and on and on he went. And of course, much, many of the people in the audience loved that. You know, that tied right in with their heart attitude, too. They wanted to ridicule the notion of hell. Who wants to believe in hell? That's not very popular. Now, this isn't a public debate, mind you, before roughly 1,100 university students. Now, what do I, as an apologist, do when someone has stood up there and has just made mincemeat emotionally out of my commitment to the Christian worldview and the doctrine of hell? Well, between you and me, all I had to do is point out this is nothing more but prejudice. There wasn't any argument here. What I said is about all my opponent has demonstrated to us tonight is that he doesn't like the Christian God. But what I want to know as a philosopher is what is the possible relevance of his not liking the Christian God? Are we supposed to move from the premise, Mr. Tavish doesn't like the Christian God, to the conclusion the Christian God doesn't exist? If we are, then the mediating premise is what? What you don't like doesn't exist. I said, and what rational man believes that? What rational man believes that because you don't like something, it doesn't exist? You know, the child who doesn't like broccoli, you know, all of a sudden the broccoli doesn't exist. You see, that looked so intelligent, so sophisticated, so sharp-tongued to the audience. And yet, all I had to do was say, this is nothing more but prejudice. This is not an argument. This is just spinning out your own desires and feelings and opinions. Big deal. So it's your opinion that God wouldn't have hell. And so if we say God has you know, a hell waiting for people like you, you don't want to believe it. But we're here to debate whether it's true or false. Now, do we have anything to say about that? So the first step in presuppositional apologetics, just to belabor the obvious, is to call down the arbitrariness of the unbeliever. When the unbeliever says, well, it's my opinion that, you say, okay. And now what's the reason for that opinion? And when they give, not reasons, but causes, that is, well, I don't desire to answer up to God, they won't say it that way. And they say, I don't want there to be a doctrine of hell. And you say, well, okay, I can see how that causes you to believe there's no doctrine of hell. But now we're trying to be rational. We're trying to be reasonable men. What's your reason for saying the Bible is wrong in that teaching? <clears throat> Watch out for arbitrary, prejudicial conjecture. No one can trust the text of the Bible. Oh, really? Do you know the state of the evidence? We don't even know if Jesus existed. Oh, really? You need to puncture that kind of skepticism because it's not based on anything. Not anything that has to do with evidence and reason. The second thing that you need to look for in this checklist in terms of your apologetical strategy or procedure is unargued philosophical bias. unargued philosophical bias. 
And the difference between number one and number two, although I don't care if you lump them together, but the, the difference I'm intending to show you here is that number one is just simple arbitrariness, ignorance, masquerading as a reason for things. Number two is a little more sophisticated. Here there are un underlying philosophical presuppositions that are very important in terms of the way the unbeliever is reasoning, and yet the unbeliever hasn't argued for them. He or she is just taking them for granted. Now, I've taught you in our course so far that everybody has a philosophical bias, if you want to put it that way. Everybody has certain beliefs that they grant a privileged position in the web of all the other things that they believe. Everybody's got their presuppositions. Okay? You can't get away from that. My argument here, under number two, is not against having philosophical bias. Everyone has it. My argument has to do with the unargued nature of that philosophical bias. It's when the unbeliever brings his or her autonomy to bear in the argument, but it's not recognizing that they're already begging the question by assuming, as philosophical baggage, an unargued point of view philosophically. We need to, as presuppositionalists, expose the philosophical pre-commitments of the critic, which are taken for granted, rather than openly acknowledged and in some way argued for and supported. <clears throat> Consider this. Even if enough external corroborating evidence were available from textual criticism, archaeology, and related sciences to authenticate all of the ordinary data which we find in the literature of Scripture, all of the linguistic facts, all the cultural facts, all the chronological facts, and so forth, there would still remain important features, indeed the most important features of the biblical narrative, over which conscientious unbelievers are going to intellectually stumble. See, we read in the Bible not only of Hittites and military battles and migrations and marriages, but we also read in the Bible of healings and floating axe heads and fiery chariots and water turned to wine and a virgin birth and resurrections. When unbelievers read of miraculous events in the Bible, their first inclination is to say, that such things cannot happen, and thus they disbelieve the written report of them. We all know that people can't walk on water, they'll say. That story must be fabricated. And before we jump into this too quickly, let's recognize that we all are familiar with that line of reason. Don't you engage in it when you're checking out at the counter at the supermarket, and you look at the tabloid headlines? Again, the one I love. I really saw this one day. Woman gives birth to her own father. You say, I didn't bother to go and examine the evidential credentials of that story. I just laughed and went on. Right? And the unbeliever, in a sense, is doing the same thing when you, we present a book that talks about floating axe heads and resurrections and a virgin birth. The unbeliever says, we know those sorts of things don't happen. Put it away. The implicit argument is that such things are impossible, so they couldn't have occurred. And that's why unbelievers dismiss in advance a book that relates miraculous events. The possibility of miraculous events is advanced, and in light of that unspoken premise, the unbeliever cast a doubtful eye upon the biblical narrative. Jesus didn't rise from the dead because we all know the dead do not rise. Unbelievers easily assume that people who live in the enlightened scientific 20th century just couldn't accept superstitious myths and fairy tales from the Bible. Don't you use a computer? Don't you use a refrigerator? And you know better having these scientific wonders than to believe in miracles. To conduct their thinking in a fully rational manner, however, Unbelievers who doubt the biblical narrative of miracles ought to pause to recognize and scrutinize their controlling premise. 
And when you are engaged in apologetics, especially in a dialogical situation, you know, over a nice informal cup of coffee, and the person says, well, I mean, I use a refrigerator and a computer. I know better than to believe in miracles. I know how the world works. Miracles just aren't possible. What you as a Christian apologist needs to do need to do is to point out the unargued philosophical bias that's involved in that remark. Not so much to um, to ridicule it or to put it down, but just to say, well, now you're aware, of course, that when you say that, your reasoning has behind it this philosophical assumption. We know miracles are impossible. And then what do you want to ask? We know that? We know that? We know that miracles are impossible? Maybe you can explain that to me, you know? Play the part of Columbo here. Could, could you just explain one thing to me? I, I don't understand this part of what you're saying. That you know that miracles aren't impossible. I understand that you might believe they're impossible. How do you know that? How do you know that miracles are impossible? Unbelievers feel they know that such events cannot take place because they've got a scientific outlook. They're convinced that nature operates in a predictable, law-like fashion. And so the unbeliever will say, miracles would run counter to the regularities of our ordinary experience. Our, our experience wouldn't be completely predictable, they protest, if there were miracles. To which the astute apologists ought to reply, isn't that the point? If miracles were not extraordinary, they wouldn't be miracles. Is it, don't you say subtly the unbeliever has tried to suck you into his worldview when he says, the reason I can't believe in miracles is because they're extraordinary. But the whole point is they're extraordinary. That's why they're called miracles. The unbeliever's bias against extraordinary events needs to be challenged then as for its rational foundations. Does the unbeliever know that all nature operates in a law-like fashion? Does the unbeliever know that? Does the unbeliever know that there can be no exceptions to that? Well, one of the things you can point out, again, not trying to win the argument in one sentence, this is not everything, but one thing you can point out is that's an awful lot to know. If you know that all nature operates in a law-like fashion, you know a lot, a lot more than I do. And maybe you're claiming a lot more than you really think you, I mean, upon reflection should be claiming. Can an unbeliever who holds to the finite nature of thinking and also the corrigibility of observation really make a universal statement about what can and cannot take place? No, within his own worldview, he's not allowed to make that kind of a claim. So what justification could the unbeliever have for his view that all nature operates in a law-like fashion. Now, I know somebody who could justify that claim. Somebody who's in touch with God could justify that claim. If God controlled the world in a completely law-like fashion, completely predictable, deterministic fashion, and told us that that's what he's doing, then we could have that as a premise, right? But then again, that's not going to be very helpful because if there is a God who does that, then the unbeliever can't dismiss God on the claim of, on the basis of the miracle claims of the Bible. Unbelievers just easily assume that people who live in the scientific 20th century can't accept superstitious myths and fairy tales from the Bible. But what the unbeliever is doing here is importing unargued philosophical baggage. <coughs> What determines the limits of possibility? Well, one's worldview, one's view of reality. And so when the unbeliever says, the Bible is not going to lead me to the metaphysic that says God exists because it has miracles in it, or claims of miracles in it, what the unbeliever is saying is, my metaphysic is such that I'm not going to allow you to, to lead me to your metaphysic. My view of reality is such that I won't allow there to be any evidence for your view of reality, that there is a God who could perform miracles. Obviously, if God exists, the possibility of miracles cannot be dismissed in advance. An all-powerful creator, a governor of the world, 
could certainly do things that are out of the ordinary and contrary to the regularities of human experience. If God exists, Jesus could certainly have been raised from the dead. To reject the Bible because of its account of miracles is just to beg the question philosophically. And I want to remind you, the problem here is not that critics of Christianity have philosophical presuppositions. It's that they never argue for those presuppositions or acknowledge them and the effect of those presuppositions in their thinking. And those presuppositions are hostile to, they're antithetical to the Christian world. <laughs> and that's why you as a Christian apologist need to not only spend time calling down the arbitrariness of the opinions spun out by the unbeliever, but you need to spend a good deal of the remainder of your time saying, but what you've just said assumes a certain philosophical point of view, and that's really what's separating us. And so you're going to point out that the unbeliever is resting on a philosophical foundation when he or she argues the way they do. And that's why they're reasoning in the manner that they do. Thirdly, you're going to look for dialectical tension in that philosophy of the unbeliever. I've already explained to you what dialectical tension refers to, and so I'm going to use it as a summary expression here, but I'm quite conscious that that's not part of your normal lingo, okay? <clears throat> and you don't need to be telling the unbeliever, quote-unquote, there's a dialectical tension in your point of view, <laughs> right? But you do want to pick up on it. You do want to point out the inconsistencies here, I'll put in parentheses, the incoherence of this worldview, this philosophical bias that the unbeliever has not bothered to argue for. Okay? So step one, look for arbitrariness, opinions that don't have any basis. Step two, look for underlying philosophical presuppositions that have not been argued, that have just been taken for granted. Step three, show the incoherence of that philosophical bias that is there. Look for the dialectical tensions. At the end of yesterday's lecture, I gave you a list of such dialectical tensions. Just, I mean, actually, if you just memorize that set of illustrations, I would think in 99 point something of the cases, you're going to have all you need. Because they come up over and over and over again. I'm going to take as my illustration of this point in my lecture the philosophy of Epicurus. And the reason I'm going to use Epicurus is because I think he's the patron saint of 20th century America. <laughs> Epicurus was born in the year 341 B.C. He was a materialistic atomist in his theory of reality. According to Epicurus, reality is made up of atoms, physical material atoms. Sound familiar? I'd say most unbelievers take it for granted reality is made up of physical atoms today. And he was a qualitative hedonist in his ethical philosophy of living. That is, when it comes to how we live our lives, Epicurus said you should live for pleasure. Sound familiar? And Epicurus was actually more sophisticated than Aristippus, who was also a hedonist about this general time. Aristippus said people should live for as much pleasure as they can possibly get. And so the quantity of pleasure is the thing that really counts. Epicurus was more sophisticated. He said you should actually live for the higher quality pleasures. And so, despite the, um, the party animal connotation of being an Epicurean today, Epicurus actually taught a little bit of wine, bread and cheese, and conversation with your friends is the highest pleasure in life. Because that way you don't end up with social diseases and a hangover. <laughs> so he's trying to be very reasonable in his, approach, in his approach to pleasure. And I think that fits in with... Um, 
our 20th century as well. There are people who give themselves over to just any kind of debauchery. But most Americans like to think that we pursue our pleasures in a very sophisticated, rational way. That's why we have safe sex at our parties. <laughs> Epicurus held that the philosophical method, he held that philosophical method should begin with the plain facts of sense perception and shape all opinions in terms of it augmented by the demand for non-contradiction. And that too strikes me as pretty pervasively the outlook of people today. If you're going to engage in philosophical method, what you need to do is begin with the plain facts of experience and then try to organize those facts of experience into opinions which will honor the law of non-contradiction. Begin with what you've experienced, that you know that for sure, and then be very consistent and logical and organize that into conclusions about what you would say philosophically. According to him, following Democritus earlier, according to Epicurus, there is no such thing as spiritual reality. There is no spiritual reality, because reality is composed of an infinite number of qualitatively identical and self-propelling atoms whose arrangement and whose ceaseless motion explain the qualities of things and their behavior. Why is it this desk appears this way? Well, because it's made up of these atoms that are falling through space, that are always active, they're in motion, and their particular configuration gives the touch and feel that the desk has, its color, and all the rest. Not bad for a guy who lived 300 years before Christ, seeing as that that's pretty much what most people think today as well. Everything is made up of atoms in motion, and it's the combinations of the atoms, the molecular structure and so forth, that accounts for the qualities of things, the way we perceive them. According to Epicurus, everything that exists, even the gods and the human soul, if they're to be explained, must be explained materially and naturalistically. If there are gods, they're really nothing more but refined atoms of some sort. If there is a human soul or mind, it's really nothing more but a refined version of the brain itself, the, the, the gray stuff in our cranium. That too fits in with the modern world, it seems to me. Because all religion, all ethical motions and so forth are explained ultimately by some material factor and factors. According to Epicurus, there was nothing to fear in death. After all, there is no afterlife, because when the body dies, that's it. There are no gods, so what's there to be afraid of? And if there's nothing to be afraid of, then you should live now for happiness or pleasure. Why then don't you live for, well, being a party animal, Epicurus said, because you don't, in the end, get a lot of pleasure out of that. You get a lot of, you know, pleasure for three or four hours on Friday night, but then you've got Saturday and Sunday where you're feeling real sick to your stomach, and maybe you have some disease that is with you for the rest of your life or whatever. So, he believed in living for pleasure, and the only moderation he put on it was for the sake of what? equanimity in your pleasure. It wasn't because he thought there was gods or an afterlife. This was a popular philosophy <coughs> in that day. When Paul went to Athens, you notice the two schools of philosophy that were dominant that he encountered were the Stoics and the Epicureans. And as I've already told you tongue-in-cheek, Epicurus is, as I see it, the patron saint of 20th century America. We're all, I mean, not each, but we're all, in the generalized sense, Epicureans today. That Epicurean philosophy of atomism, observational epistemology, live for pleasure, hedonistic ethic, that Epicurean philosophical bias is going to come into the argument of many unbelievers. Not all, but many. I have to generalize here. And it will come in in an unargued fashion. It'll just be taken for granted. Everything's atoms. Whatever we know, we know by observation that is formed and <coughs> by the law of non-contradiction. And the way we should live is to live for pleasure. This is a popular philosophy. But if you do apologetics in the way that I'm teaching you, 
you're going to go after it and show that it's not at all a cogent philosophy upon cross-examination. The unbeliever has taken for granted things which are incoherent. Let's take the premise that all knowledge is perceptual in nature. Many of the people you talk to are just going to assume if you know something, it's because you have perceptions to back it up. But of course, the premise that all knowledge is perceptual in nature is not one that is known on the basis of perception, is it? And so here you have a philosophy that refutes itself. Don't expect the unbeliever to come out with the banners flying, saying, it's under this philosophy that I'm working and thinking and reasoning. I believe all knowledge is perceptual. The non-Christian is just going to take that as unargued philosophical bias. It's your job to point out the bias and then, as we put up here thirdly, point out the dialectical tension, their incoherence in that. Moreover, what Epicurus said about reality could not possibly have been known by means of perception. Stop and think about that. Epicurus could not possibly have perceived imperceptibly small bits of matter. Now we'll talk about the 20th century in just a moment. But in his day and age, before electron microscopes and so forth, how could Epicurus have said reality is made up of bits of matter that are imperceptible? He's just told us everything we know is based on what? Perception. And then he turns right around and gives us a metaphysic that commits him to something that he has not perceived. Now, about the 20th century, we still don't perceive the things that we talk about. It's more sophisticated than Epicurus, and yes, we, we do have microscopes that we call electron microscopes. They aren't really microscopes that show electrons, most people don't know that. But we get traces of electrons, shadows of electrons, we think. But you know, in our day and age, we talk about subatomic particles, right? We talk about the weak and the strong force within the atom. Has anybody perceived those things? So here we have people who are committed to a perceptual approach to knowledge, and they'll turn right around and talk about things that they don't perceive. You need to point out the dialectical tension there. You need to point out the inconsistency, the incoherence in that philosophy of life. Epicurus universalized about the behavior of these imperceptible atoms. But of course he couldn't perceive all the atoms, so how could he possibly justify his conclusion that this is the character of atoms, they always act this way? Most of the unbelievers you talk to are going to have the same problem. They're going to say, the world always operates this way. And you say, you've, you've seen all the world can do at all times? I mean, all you can say is, as far as you know in your experience, you've never seen a man rise from the dead. But that has nothing to do with whether people in their experience have seen a man rise from the dead. The point is only your philosophy is incoherent. Mm. On the one hand, you say you can only know what you observe, and then you use as an operating premise, we know that all of the world operates in this way. <coughs> Moreover, the naturalistic and the atomistic theory of reality advanced by Epicurus could not credibly explain man having free will. Because man is nothing more but what? A mechanical combination of atoms falling through space. And so Epicurus, knowing that he was really up against an embarrassing problem here, offered a theory to account for man's free will. It was the theory that there must have been a swerve in the fall of these atoms so that some atoms start bumping into other atoms and that creates creativity and change. Unpredictability. And that's supposed to account for man's free will. Well, what do you want to say about that philosophical hypothesis of a swerve in the fall of the atoms? or in our day and age, a more sophisticated version is, well, the atoms operate in a certain way in the human mind so that people make decisions. But what they're doing is predictable according to the laws of physics, biology, and chemistry, right? 
Yes, but nevertheless, in some special cases, Adams act in a certain way. It gives us the illusion of having free will. But you see, this deprives man of purposeful choice, doesn't it? Epicurus thought he was accounting for free will, but he didn't account for free will at all. He only accounted for what? Why it appeared that we make choices. And the accounts that physicists or biologists offer us today does not really grant free will to man. It only grants that man appears to have free will. Since we don't know all those factors and it's unpredictable, then things don't always happen in a uniform fashion. But free will is more than a departure from uniformity. It's a purposeful departure from uniformity. And so, it turns out, Epicurus can't really give ethical advice, can he? If you tell people, live for pleasure. But if you tell people to do things in a certain way, that assumes what? That they have the freedom to make that choice. Let me give you a modern illustration. I've already used it, but uh, it bears repeating. Jean-Paul Sartre tells us the worst thing you could possibly do is deny your freedom. Live as though someone else can tell you what to do. Live under the control of a teacher, a priest, a policeman, your parents, whatever it may be. Jean-Paul Sartre tells you, you're living in bad faith if you will not authentically affirm your freedom and do what you think you ought to do. To which we ought to say back to him, well, then Jean-Paul, we're not being free and authentic people if we listen to you tell us to free and authentic people. Because you tell us it's bad for us to live as though we're not free. But who are you to tell us what's bad if I'm really free? So Epicurus tries to have an ethic in a worldview where no ethic makes sense. Besides, if the thinking that I'm going through, according to Epicurus, is nothing more than atoms falling through space, if I can't help thinking the way I do, except for whatever creative arbitrary swerves there are in the atoms, why should I bother with philosophical investigation and debate at all? I mean, how can Epicurus account for any kind of argument if, in fact, we never freely engage in reasoning, we just end up saying what the atoms falling through space lead us to say? Given the problems in Epicurus's theory of knowledge, how did he know there was no afterlife? It just seems like this rational, popular, sophisticated philosophical opinion proves to reduce to nothing more but subjective choices on the, on the part of Epicurus, and choices which prove to be incoherent at that. And this leads then to the fourth step in presuppositional apologetics as a general strategy. And that is pointing to the failure of the unbeliever to provide the preconditions of intelligibility. That's a mouthful. If I were to use that as the opening line in our course, you would rightly say, how do you expect us to understand that? But I can understand, I mean, I can expect you to understand it now because we've been talking about it <clears throat> for a number of hours. This is just shorthand for talking about what would be the necessary truth, the, the underlying preconditioning truth about man and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives that can make sense out of our reasoning, our science, our moral judgments, human freedom, human dignity. And the, what you want to point out ultimately to the unbeliever who continues to argue against the Christian worldview is that my worldview is to be preferred to yours because yours does not provide the preconditions of intelligibility for reasoning and for science and morality and human freedom and human dignity. 
It is possible, of course, that before you get to the fourth level here, the Holy Spirit's brought conviction and the unbeliever is willing to become a Christian. I don't want to give the impression, I think people have somehow falsely gotten this idea, that presuppositionalists are always insisting that we finally get to the philosophical level of comparing these worldviews. Please let us show that you fail to provide the preconditions of intelligibility. It isn't always necessary to do that, but it is in principle what your apologetic must come down to. You know why? Because the unbeliever should point out, we too have a philosophy of life. We too have a world. We too have our privileged beliefs that we don't allow any kind of evidence to, um, to disrupt. And so, when all is said and done, if he interprets all the evidence in light of his presupposition, and I interpret all the evidence in light of my presupposition, we're going to have to finally argue those presuppositions. And this is one of the distinctive things about the apologetic that's been taught by Cornelius Van Til. Gordon Clark is sometimes called a presuppositionalist by people. <laughs> and I'm not jealous for the, uh, for the, uh, the term so much. Uh, if people want to say that, and then they give some general abstract definition that includes Clark and Van Til, well then so be it. I, I don't think it's helpful, though. I think it's more confusing than it is enlightening to put them together in this way. Because Gordon Clark says that our ultimate assumptions or premises are axioms that are not subject to proof. And that's why Clark, at the end of his career, openly endorsed fideism as our approach to apologetics. He openly said, we have faith in this set of axioms, the other guy has faith in that set of axioms, and there really isn't any argument between the two of them. In the end, it depends on the work of the Holy Spirit changing the other guy's heart so that he'll change his axioms. I've already explained to you the mistake that is made there where Clark moves from reasons for Christian faith to causes of Christian faith and doesn't really answer the question, how then can you resolve the conflict between axioms? He says you can't. That it's just a fideistic choice and then you're consistent and you live within your worldview and you try to knock down what the others say. In fact, Clark says you knock it down by showing they can't know anything, not anything not anything based on empirical, observational um, thinking or approaches. And as a Vantillian, and I hope to being true to the Bible, I don't agree with him that all empirical methodology um, fails to provide knowledge for us, that we can't know anything except what's in the Bible. But I agree with the premise taught by Van Til, that apart from what the Bible teaches, you couldn't know anything in principle based on your empirical methodology. But now, back to Clark. His view of a presupposition, then, is an axiom which is not provable. It's something that you fideistically choose and then you try to be consistent with in all of your reasoning. Van Til's approach to a presupposition is that it is a precondition of intelligibility and therefore it can be argued for indirectly. You can reduce your opponent to absurdity. You can do an internal critique of the unbeliever's philosophy to show that on that philosophy he couldn't know anything at all. And beyond that, that his reasoning, his, his appeal to history and science and other things has all along been assuming your philosophy as a way of arguing against your philosophy. And so, what we mean by presuppositions is quite different. <clears throat> While I'm on the subject, I might point out that Francis Schaeffer had another use of the word presupposition that differs from Van Til and Clark both. And you can see this when Francis Schaeffer has his discussion in um, Death in the City. He has a chapter, The Universe in Two Chairs. And according to Schaefer, we can imagine that you have a believer and an unbeliever sitting in a chair in this room, and they're going to discuss with each other what they can know and what reality is. And the uh, unbeliever does all of his scientific analysis of the paint on the walls and on and on and on. And according to Schaefer, 
the unbeliever then lays out all the truth that he has learned about the world based on his material analysis of the room, the chair, whatever it may be. And the Schaefer says, that's all fine as far as it goes, but it's only half the orange. It's only half the orange. Now let me as a Christian supplement what you have said. You see, Schaefer did not look upon Christian presuppositions as the precondition for all intelligibility because if they were the precondition for intelligibility the unbeliever wouldn't have half the orange at all, he'd have nothing at all. Schaefer should have said you're not being true to your own presuppositions. Schaefer said we must ask men to consider the hypotheses, the worldview presented by Christianity, that is to say uh, uniformity of natural causes in an open system where God can enter the system and compare that to the philosophy of the uniformity of natural causes in a closed system and then ask which of those two hypotheses fits the facts as we know them of the natural world and the mannishness of man. Now in that kind of remark you can see that Schaefer is not dealing with presuppositions as the ultimate commitment by which we approach science and evaluation. He's actually treating a presupposition as a hypothesis subject to testing. And so if he's talking about something that can be tested, then he's not talking about his ultimate presupposition because whatever he uses to test it is his ultimate presupposition. And so it may be very easy uh, to be confused, readily confused, when you read the literature of 20th century reformed apologists. Schaefer, Clark, and Van Til don't mean the same thing by the word presupposition. But in the presuppositional approach that Van Til taught us, ultimately, in principle, and many times in actual conversation, when we're defending the faith, it comes down to our pointing out that the unbeliever has a particular presupposition, the believer has a particular presupposition or set of presuppositions, as I taught you, and we must argue in terms of the preconditions of intelligibility that ours is correct and theirs is not correct. Remember the indirect approach? We have two positions, two worldviews, we invite the unbeliever to stand within our worldview to see that all of his objections are not really forceful objections. We don't answer the fool according to his folly, lest we be like him. But then we stand within the unbeliever's worldview to look at his basic presuppositions and explain to him what that would entail. We answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit lest he think, well, I have a basis for science, and I have a basis for logic, I have a basis for moral absolutes and human freedom and dignity. And so the final step in the procedure is to show that the empiricism and the atheism of our Epicurean friends is completely inadequate to give an account of, or even to make possible, objectivity in man's thinking rationality in man's thinking. Impossible to give an account of or make intelligible man's freedom are moral absolutes. Now, it would be helpful to give some illustrations of how we can show that the unbeliever can't make sense out of moral absolutes, rationality, objectivity, science, and so forth. And so although I'm not pursuing the outline on the board here, A would be a consideration of the two sets of presuppositions, the indirect argument that I've just talked about, and B would be illustrations of the faultiness of the unbeliever's worldview with respect to these preconditions of intelligibility. going to subdivide here as well. We can deal with three basic kinds of worldviews. You're going to encounter one of three basic kinds of worldviews, and obviously within each one you can draw further distinctions. But all worldviews are either going to be materialistically monistic, 
where they may be immaterialistically monistic, but I'm not going to talk about them. Because they just, if they're immaterialistic, monistic, they deny all distinctions, and so there's no logic and there's no arguments. <laughs> Do I, I, maybe I need to talk about that. Was that too fast for you? When a Hindu says all distinctions are illusion, the Hindu is also rejecting logic. But if the Hindu is rejecting logic, then the Hindu can't rationally argue about Hinduism or Christianity. Now, I, I might patiently take three and a half hours discussing that with the Hindu, what I just took basically 15 seconds to say to you. But I trust you should all be on to that by now. When you expose the presuppositions of Hinduism, you've also shown that Hindus don't have the preconditions of intelligibility. They can't make intelligible our very dialogue. Why then are we having this conversation if you and I are one and the same? You can't live according to your worldview. You keep asking me to engage in yoga and meditation and so forth so that I can enter into nirvana. Well, that assumes that I'm not in nirvana right now. But according to your view, in nirvana there are no distinctions. And so I can't be somewhere other than nirvana because everything is nirvana on your worldview. Given your worldview, there would be no rational discussion possible between us. Okay. Now, materialistic monism is what you're going to run into or dualism, or some religious version of philosophy. All said and done, those are the only possibilities. The person who is an atheist and says everything's matter in motion. There are variations, but worldviews can be, you know, categorized under that general group. <coughs> And then there'll be people who say, no, I don't think that matter is everything. I believe that there's a realm of matter, and there's also an immaterial realm of ideas, or laws, or values, whatever it may be. And so we'll call that dualism. You either have materialism, dualism, or some religious philosophy. And of course, there's a plethora of religious philosophies. How do we as presuppositionalists pursue step four, showing the failure to provide the preconditions of intelligibility with respect to the different worldviews that we can encounter? Let's start with the materialist. We want to point out to the materialist that he or she can claim that only concrete particular things exist that there are no material or abstract realities. That he or she can claim that all events are random, there's no personal plan, no, um, no control over this world in which we live. And he or she can claim that reality amounts to matter and motion, but they cannot think or act a reason in that way. They can claim that, but they can't reason or act. They cannot think in that fashion at all. Five questions, quickly, to address to the materialist, to the atheist. One, why be rational? Two, what's the origin of life? Three, why think in terms of scientific inference? Four, why think in terms of general principles? Five, why be moral? I'm going to talk about each one of them. But I want you to see there's an overwhelming avalanche of philosophical problems with materialism. One, why be rational? I once had a, a radio dialogue with George Smith who wrote the book, The Case Against God. And uh, this book was really, you know, played up and so forth, and we're supposed to take all the great arguments, you know, into account, and it's very, you know, deep and profound and so forth. And in my interview uh, with him on the radio, I said, um, George, one of the basic flaws I find in your book is your conception of Christian faith. You have the idea that reason 
takes all of us so far, and then some of us in this world have a leap of Christian faith that goes beyond reason. I want to point out that in the Augustinian tradition, that's not our conception of reason and faith. We believe that all reasoning rests upon faith. And so faith is not other than reason. Faith is the most reasonable thing because reason itself relies on it. And I notice that in your book you say all of us must be rational and not follow this Christian idea of reason. Now, his notion of reason is not really the Augustinian one. But I pressed him further and I said, but given your conception that reason is apart from faith, when you say that all men must follow their reasoning and not do like the Christians and have a blind leap of faith, I want to know on what basis you can say that. Why are men under obligation to be rational? You know, it was just almost like something the guy had never considered or just blitzed his thinking. You know, I don't mean that he just crumbled on the radio. He was really quite arrogant and wanted to keep, you know, pushing things back at me. That's fine, but he didn't have any answer for that. I said, now, I think all men should be rational. I think we are under obligation to use our intellectual tools to glorify God and to learn about this world. We should be consistent and so forth and so on. I think we should believe things on good evidence. I believe everybody should be rational, but I believe that because God requires all men to be rational. So within my worldview, I can make, sh I can make sense of this demand for rationality. But you know, if this world is sound and fury signifying nothing, why should anybody have to be rational? Why don't I just live moment by moment and not worry about inconsistencies or rational theories or in, in, intelligent uh, uh, ways of uh, interpreting my experience? Why don't I just think one thing one time and another thing another time and not care about logic at all? After all, logic has nothing to do with this world. You see, the strange thing is about the materialist is the materialist who wants to be rational has already departed from his materialism. Another aspect of this question, why be rational at all? If the person you're talking to is really a materialist, then they have a naturalistic explanation for everything that we think and do. The naturalist says, what's going on in this gray and this gray matter in my cranium is controlled by the laws of physics, and chemistry, and biology. I don't really think. I'm just like a weed that's growing. And this particular weed expresses itself through vocal cords and all that, but nevertheless, weeds don't think and make decisions, and neither do I. We're all subject, basically, to the laws of physics. I'm just at a more complicated level, a more complex level. So if naturalism is true, then there is no mind and there is no objective reasoning and no freedom to my thought. And so if naturalism is true, why do you call on people to be rational? If naturalism is true, there is no rationality. There's just whatever people end up thinking and doing. Atheism destroys the demand for rationality. Secondly, What's the origin of life? <clears throat> I have to ask the atheist world, where would life come from? According to the atheist theory, the reigning dogma or prejudice in our day, as you know, life came from non-life. That ought to be enough right there to make any rational person snicker. Excuse me? Life came from non-life. In fact, I thought it was one of the established principles of biology that spontaneous generation is not true. And you know what the atheist will say? I mean, he may have a more sophisticated way of doing it. Basically, the atheist says, we want one exception. <laughs> Just give us one exception to our universal rule. We say, well, if I give you one exception, it's not universal. And if we start giving out exceptions, then the Christian can just as easily say, I want an exception too. At every point that you think that what I'm saying is not rational, not consistent, then I just want an exception from the demand of rationality. No, I cannot give you an exception to where life come from. The idea that there was a prebiotic phase of evolution 
where chemicals just somehow came together accidentally and life originated is a preposterous scientific theory. It's a preposterous philosophical notion too because it assumes that something that doesn't have any of the characteristics of the final product came together with something else that had none of the characteristics of the final property, but in bringing those two somethings together, you got the final product. It makes no difference how much you tinker with or work with a cake mix. You're not ever going to get a political constitution out of a cake mix. And I don't mean a cake mix box having somehow a political constitution in it. You all know how to make it, well, maybe you don't all know, but you have some general idea of how cakes are made. You also have some idea of the character of political constitutions. They have no relationship to each other. They don't share, you know, attributes. And so for somebody to say, I think political constitutions arise from cake mixes, you say, well, that's preposterous. And, and some say, give us time, we're working on it. <laughs> that's essentially what the evolutionist is doing. He says, well, that's right, life and intelligence and morality have attributes which don't have anything to do with inert chemicals. But give us time, we're working on it. Let us tinker with the cake mix and eventually we'll get freedom, we'll get morality, we'll get intelligence, we'll get life itself. Inorganic things do not, by mechanical reconfiguration, give rise to the organic. And so, secondly, we see the absurdity of the atheistic materialistic worldview in that they have qualities coming from their opposites. Life coming from non-life, the moral coming from the non-moral, the intelligent coming from the unintelligent. That's not good science or good philosophy. Why be rational? What's the origin of life? Thirdly, why think in terms of scientific inference at all? If you're a materialist and you believe that everything happens by chance, there is no personal control over the universe and what happens in history, then how can you hold to the uniformity of nature? In a random chance universe, there is no basis for expecting the way things have happened in the past to be the way they happen in the future. Now you need to be aware of the fact, as a Christian apologist, that all human reasoning, all human experience, all use of language presupposes uniformity. Why is that? Well, if the way the natural world operates is radically different from moment to moment, then I couldn't learn anything. I couldn't learn anything because every experience I have doesn't give me any basis by analogy for what's going to happen later. Okay? So I stub my toe this night and it hurts. That has nothing to do with whether stubbing my toe will hurt in the future. If it's a completely random universe. But if there is uniformity in the natural order, then from analogy, from past experience, I can predict what will happen in the future. So I'm going to avoid, you know, bumping my, uh, my toes into that chair leg because I, I don't want that kind of pain. That's a very homespun, down-to-earth illustration. Sending someone to the moon based on calculations and observations and experiments and so forth we've done in the past, I mean, you'd have to be out of your mind to get in a rocket to be sent to the moon if you really thought that this universe was random. <laughs> So he says, trust us, we've done a lot of tests in the past. And he says, but why do you think those tests in the past provide any model or analogy for what will happen in the future? If you're an atheist, why be scientific at all then? If you're an atheist, there's no uniformity to nature. Now, I once debated an atheist, or, uh, Dr. Stein, who when confronted with this kind of thing said, well, it's just the characteristic of the material world to be uniform." <laughs> Anybody see any kind of uh, unargued philosophical bias there? Now, the most obvious indication of bias is that he just wants to say the world's like this, pure and simple. Oh, you don't need a reason for that. 
Now, science is the demand for what? A reason for the events to take place. And what you want to tell me then, Dr. Stein, is the whole edifice of science rests upon no reason. So science rests upon the opposite of itself, indeed the very violation of what it demands. You don't need reasons for the uniformity of nature, you say, but then everything else calls for reasoning, for causes of the events that take place. So you're not even living in terms of your own world. But I'm going to press beyond this. When he says that matter simply has this character, what has he assumed about matter? That it's not constantly changing, right? That it has, quote unquote, a character. But the very notion that matter has an unchanging character is the very question under dispute. Does matter have an unchanging character? So that whenever you put the vinegar and the soda together, the cork pops off. Is that one of the attributes of vinegar and soda in combination? That hydrogen's released and so the cork's going to pop off? Well, only if hydrogen from Tuesday is like hydrogen on Wednesday, vinegar from Tuesday is like vinegar on Wednesday, and so forth. Only if matter has an inherent character can you do these predictions. But that's the very thing we're asking for. What's the basis for making these predictions? You can't say the material world is predictable. Why? Well, because its character is to be predictable. That's just unreasoning prejudice. And so here we have the atheist without any rational foundation for rationality in reasoning. Any rational foundation for the origin of life without any rational foundation for science. Fourthly, why should atheists think in terms of any general principles? Everybody to think must use general principles. That is to say, everybody is committed to classes of things. Our experiences are not taken as novel, new experiences, one by one by one by one by one by one, having no connection with anything before. Not everything is brand new. Okay? The last few nights I've been in the same hotel room, and when I've gotten up every morning, it was the same hotel room. That's what I want to say. But if materialism is true, and only material particulars exist, then it turns out the experience I had getting up in the hotel room the first morning is not the same experience as I had the second morning, the third, and so forth. Those are all just momentary experiences. And therefore, there's no sameness between them. Unless, unless classes exist. To put it another way, unless something called similarity is real. But a similarity, a particular thing that we encounter, have any of you ever run into similarity itself? No, I've never known anybody to say, Dr. Bonson, I'm really worried. I've lost my, you know, my, my uh, quantity of similarity. I don't know where I put it. Similarity is not the sort of thing that you, that you materially encounter. Here's something else you don't encounter in the material world, the laws of logic. Laws of logic are general principles of reason. They're prescriptive in character. The classes or general principles that we think in terms of are descriptive in character. But nevertheless, they are both immaterial. When I say classes are descriptive and immaterial, I think in terms of giraffes and cats and running and events and qualities that can be categorized together. So there is cowness in terms of which I recognize particular animals in the field as cows. I don't just say, oh, there's Beulah and there's Beauregard, there's no connection between the two of them. I say, there's something that makes me say they're both cows. But that something that makes me say they're both cows is not a cow, nor is it anything physical. In fact, if it were, then I'd have to have something that unites whatever this something is and the two cows into another category 
by which I can unite, I can say this something belongs to cowness and not to catness. And so whatever it is that unites the cows together cannot itself be a material particular. It has to be universal. It has to be abstract, and therefore it has to be immaterial. We're back to my point. The unbeliever who is an atheist therefore is making use of categories which are immaterial, even if it's only the category of similarity, and laws of logic which are immaterial and prescriptive for the way that we should reason. And so why should we reason or think in terms of general principles at all if we are materialist? Why have categories like barns and redness and cows and the laws of logic if you're a materialist? Now you all wanted illustrations and so these are the illustrations. I'm going to give you more. But this is the sort of thing you need to think in terms of. Many of us don't want to be philosophical, though, in, in some of this. And because of brevity, and also because of my own training and personality, it may seem somewhat abstract. But all of you can think this way. All of you can push these issues. With some practice, you'll do it better. There's no question about that. But you need not be intimidated by it because it's philosophical. Everybody's going to ask, why is it that we speak of these objects as being cows? Why don't we just say experience, experience? Why don't we just have names for every single experience we have and nothing is ever common? Why do we think that there are common or universal laws of thinking? The only reason I do so is because as a Christian, I know that the mind of God unifies the world and controls the world and my thinking should emulate his. But I don't know why a materialist, why an atheist would do so. And then the fifth question that I rattled off real quickly is, why be moral? If naturalism is true, I can say two things for sure. First, there are no absolutes. If naturalism is true, everything's in flux. And whatever happens, happens. There are no absolutes. There are no absolute prescriptions. There's only descriptions of moment-to-moment-to-moment -to -moment -to -moment experience. If naturalism is true, then from that we'd have to say there can be no absolute prescriptions. But if there are no absolute prescriptions, there's no ethics, is there? There's no thou shalt or thou shalt not, which is without qualification. There's no universal obligation in a world that's completely naturalistic. Secondly, if naturalism is true, there's no human freedom or dignity by which people choose to live a life which is noble or ignoble, to do what is right or what is wrong. If naturalism is true, we don't have any freedom or any dignity to maintain anyway. What is, is. That's pretty profound, right? Whatever happens, happens. So that on the materialistic approach to reality, when it's reported to us that Hitler <coughs> engaged in genocide against a number of human beings, or there are criminals who have raped and killed people, or people who have molested children, all you can say as a, a naturalist is, poop happens. Right? things that are ugly and smelly take place. What else was that? I can't tell you it's wrong. Because in a naturalistic universe there is no wrong. There's no freedom to choose between right and wrong and there's no absolute prescription by which whatever I did could be right or wrong. So naturalism destroys all morality too. Now I should warn you that many atheists who have gone to the university and have studied under atheist professors will have been taught Here's the answer to that problem. Naturalists try to live moral lives. And so you're wrong to say that naturalism destroys ethics. Because people can choose values by which to live. Well, first of all, you need to say, you mean they can choose values by which to live? I thought in the naturalistic world, everything happens by the laws of physics and chemistry and biology. But whatever it is that's going on there, let's not call it a choice. That's kind of problematic, isn't it? 
whatever that's going on there is still not an absolute prescription that's being chosen. It's just what somebody decides to do. So let's say that you decided to live a noble life of self-sacrifice and protection of the weak. And so you're real upset with what Hitler did. Now you come to me, or I'm talking to you, and I say, you really can't condemn what Hitler does. You're going to say, I do condemn what Hitler does. Because I believe in self-sacrifice and protecting the weak. I say, well, that, you know, that's fine that, you, that you've chosen to live that kind of life. My point is you can't condemn Hitler for not having chosen the same lifestyle with you. Because on your naturalistic presuppositions, there is no obligation for Hitler to be like you, to be self-sacrificial or to care for the weak. Um, at the debate I had at Davis with uh, Edward Tabish, uh, this Jewish lawyer, he complained about um, his relatives having died at Auschwitz. That's a very sensitive subject, and I tried to address that sensitively. I said, I as a Christian condemn what happened to your relatives. It's morally outrageous, it's atrocious. But what I have to point out to you is that on your worldview, you have no basis for condemning it at all. On your worldview, why should Hitler be under any obligation not to torture and maim and kill anybody he wants? What one animal does to another animal is morally irrelevant if you're a naturalist. Because what? What is, is. Who happens. That's it. That's all you can say. You don't like it. You find it smelly. But it nevertheless happens. End of story. Okay, so when you deal with the worldview of atheism or materialism, we finally get down to this level. We have to say, you see, you can't provide the preconditions of intelligibility for rationality, for understanding life, for thinking scientifically, for thinking at all, logically, and in terms of general principles, or being moral. So when somebody says, well, your, your Christian worldview is already assumed when you take the evidence and are led to Christian conclusions. But on my, on my non-Christian worldview, I don't have to be led to those conclusions. We have to say you're right. If you keep your autonomous presuppositions, the evidence we give you will not lead you to Christian conclusions. But you won't be able to draw any conclusions because you won't be able to be rational at all. The proof of God's existence, is the coin going to drop now? Is what? That without God you couldn't prove anything. <laughs> Dealing with the materialist, many people will say, however, is the easy task. Once you catch on to these, these criticisms, it really isn't all that difficult. It will become easier for you as you do it more and more. I mean, the materialist is philosophically, I mean, a sitting duck. But what about worldviews like dualism and religious worldviews? How now can we deal with them? And so let's expand our outline further and try to talk about those possibilities. If we move away from the atheistic, materialistic, or naturalistic viewpoint, to a, a, an outlook that's more like Plato's, a more idealistic worldview, what are we to say? Plato held that the, there's a physical world, this world of time and space, but he also believed there's a world of ideals, or ideas. He called them forms. We might say formulas. There was a world that is the rational essence of everything that we find in this world. So in this world, we run into Huey, Dewey, and Louie out on the lake. But in the other world, there's the rational formula, the ideal or the idea of duck. And that's why we call those three things out on the lake ducks, because they all are part of that idea or that formula of duckness.
That's Plato in our modern world, well, throughout history too, but in our modern world, there are many people who say, I believe in the physical world, but I also believe in values. I believe that, that, that there are ideas. I, I believe in the laws of logic. I believe in the laws of morality. Okay, now you're defending the faith, not with the materialistic, atheistic naturalist. Like I say, he's a sitting duck. You can philosophically knock that out. But as you think about it, most of my arguments don't seem so good when you talk to the dualist, the person who says, oh, I think there's matter and ideas, matter and laws, matter and values. And you're right. Most of the criticisms that we would urge against the atheist don't work so well against Plato and the people today who say, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. That's what idealists are like in our day, right? They say, well, we live in a physical world, but we also believe that there's a spirit of goodwill that should animate men. If, did I understand, right? Isn't that the, the end of the story? Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus because there is goodwill by which we give children presents and so forth. There's more to this world than just matter. There's also goodwill. Well, I'm using a very philosophically unsophisticated illustration. But many of the people you talk to are unsophisticated dualists. They'll say, oh, I believe in the laws of logic, and so I don't have the problem with Dr. Stein. I think that we can have a debate, and we should follow the laws of logic, because I believe in the laws of logic. And I also believe that you can't win a debate by shooting people. So, Dr. Bonson, you can't expect me to accept your challenge to Dr. Stein to, uh, I mean, you can't expect that you're going to win by challenging me, show why I shouldn't shoot you to win this debate. That is, show me that there are moral absolutes, in which case you have to be a Christian. I believe that it's wrong to kill people, but I still don't believe in the Christian worldview. Now, we're not talking about, but I believe in some other religious worldview. I just believe that there's right and wrong. And I believe that there's logic. <coughs> Let me strengthen your hand at this point, because many of you, if you're paying attention, are thinking, this shouldn't be difficult to refute at all. In fact, aren't we back up to one and two? Here's somebody who says, oh, you can't refute me as being a materialist because I believe in immaterial values. I believe in the laws of logic. You're not going to have a hard time dealing with this, because the next question is what you've already thought of. You are better philosophers than you may have thought. This question is, well, how do you bring those two together? What's the relationship between those two things? Now, on your view, there's matter. Where did it come from? And on your view, there are laws or values, immaterial things. Where did they come from? What are the possibilities? They're both eternal, so they can come from anywhere. One's eternal and the other isn't. Okay, let's look at most of the possibilities. If they're both eternal, how did they ever get together? You might want to say, well, matter decided that it wanted to get married to ideas. Matter doesn't have any personality. It can't choose to do anything. So the way in which matter and ideals and values got together can't be on the material side of things. You say, well then maybe ideas, values, and logic decided to bring them together. But ideas and values and logic are abstract. They aren't personal at all. You might be interested, just as a matter of historical curiosity, to know Plato's answer to this. Plato said, oh, there must have been a personal demiurge that brought them together. Plato knew very well matter and ideas would never get together on their own. If they're both eternal, then there must be some other eternal thing that is personal that brings them together. Plato also said, by the way, and I know that's only a myth, I have to resort to a myth because I don't have any philosophical explanation of how you can get things which have conflicting attributes together in one realm. Conflicting attributes, matter is particular, ideas are universal. Matter is contingent, ideas are necessary, laws are necessary. How is that which is universal and necessary somehow in fruitful contact with that which is particular 
and contingent. And so Plato said, I don't know, just grant me one exception to my philosophical rationalism. All I want is to appeal to mythology once, and then I can explain everything else. You see, that's the problem with all unbelieving thinking. They always want the one grand exception. Let me get started, and then I can argue against you Christians. And what, what am I teaching you to do, in essence? Don't let them get started. Argue with them at the presuppositional level and say, I want to know on your presuppositions how matter and ideals, how matter and values ever got together and there's any relationship to them. If they're both eternal, then you would think you have two things which are on two different tracks, really, and there's no contact between them. So the only other alternative is to say one is more basic than the other, right? Okay, but if one is more basic than the other, which is which? If matter is more basic, and ideals grow out of matter, or develop, evolve, whatever, out of matter, don't you see we're really back to the first option we were looking at? Materialism. What you have here is just a more sophisticated version of materialism that says really laws and values somehow developed out of the material world. Well, if they did, how did that which is particular and contingent give rise to that which is universal and necessary? That's philosophical nonsense, again. Well, it has to be the other way around then. It must be that the physical world developed out of the world of ideas, out of the world of forms and values. Well, how could ideas give rise to that which is non-ideal? How could ideas do anything? How do ideas develop into a physical world where there are trees and fish and clouds in the sky? I mean, that's just a preposterous philosophy. So, in essence, what we're saying is any dualistic approach, any worldview that has both matter and non-matter is going to have to face up to the problem of its dualism. Why then do we have the two things interacting? Why in our experience do we have both matter and ideas? Both matter and values? Plato put it this way. The soul once existed in the realm of ideas. <clears throat> if you do an internal critique of Platonic philosophy, I hope I'm not pushing too hard on you right now, but you need to understand that last sentence doesn't make sense in terms of Plato's philosophy. He says, the soul once existed in the realm of ideas. No, no, Plato. On your view, only the idea of the soul could exist in the realm of ideas. Not the soul. And so, where does the soul exist? Plato is contradicting his own philosophy when he says the soul once had concourse among the ideas. And then according to him, the soul comes into the body and is there entombed for a period of time. And eventually the soul escapes and goes back to the realm of ideas. Plato says that that's why um, all philosophy is a longing for death. Because all philosophy is a longing for the ideas, and that's where our soul will go when we're finally released from this body. But my question is, how did the soul, where did the soul come from? Is it eternal? Are there a lot of eternal souls? Are all of us little gods? What are you telling us, Plato? Where did the soul come from if it's not eternal? And if it, I mean, if the soul existed at all, no matter where it came from, it couldn't have existed in the realm of ideas because the soul's not an idea. So how did the soul have concourse with the ideas? The very problem that Plato is trying to solve on earth is just now replicated in another realm because he thinks he has two things, right? Ideas and the material world. The soul is supposed to be the mediator between these two. But the soul can't be the mediator between the two because the soul's not an idea. Ah. What do you do then? Plato said, I can't account for this. 
All I can do is tell you a story. I have this mythology of the soul coming into the body and it comes in remembering the ideas. I don't know how it knew the ideas, but it comes into this world remembering the ideas and that's how values and ideas get in contact with our physical body. The chances are that your next door neighbor that you're talking to about the faith is not going to resort to mythology in arguing against your Christianity. It's not very likely that you have a neighbor that's going to say, I can't believe all these myths in the Bible because I've got my own myth, thank you. Most modern dualists haven't even asked themselves the question, how do I get the two things unified in one worldview? And so you do an internal critique of the unbeliever system. Materialism won't work. It destroys the preconditions of rationality. The preconditions of rationality can't be saved under dualism because dualism is arbitrary and incoherent. And that leaves only one option, if you're not going to be a Christian, is that you have to have an alternative religious worldview. We say God's the answer to all this. God created the physical world out of nothing. It's God's mind that's the, the basis for the laws of logic. It's God's character that gives us the moral laws by which we live. So we have the preconditions of intelligibility within the Christian worldview. Somebody says, yes, well, why the Christian worldview? One of, one of the questions that you want me to answer is why does it have to be the Christian worldview? Why not just theism in general? Okay, you've asked, so I'm going to tell you. Because there isn't any such thing as theism in general. It can't be theism in general because there ain't anything like that. There's only particular versions of theism. Okay? Every version of theism, therefore, needs to be treated as its own particular kind of worldview. And how do you answer the various versions of theism? In the same way that you've answered the materialist and the dualist, by doing an internal critique of that worldview. How would that work? Well, to do an internal critique of a different religion, you're obviously going to ask at least this question, why do you believe what you believe? On what authority do you do so? And if there is no answer to that question, then you're dealing with something that is, look at number one, you're ejected because now that's just arbitrariness. <laughs> you talk to some other religious point of view and you say, why do you believe this? People say, I don't know, I just do. Well, that's arbitrariness, so that's no threat to Christianity. You say, oh, so you have arbitrariness, or you have Christian rationality. Those are the choices. Well, again, in apologetics, that's all we need to reduce things to. If you wish to be rational, you have a reason for the hope that is in you. If you wish to be rational, you have to be a Christian. In order to be a whatever it is out here, you need to give up rationality and affirm arbitrariness. Everybody can believe whatever they want. Of course, the arbitrary person has to allow you the same arbitrariness and everybody else. So there's no apologetical argument with that kind of religion. Do you hear me? Sure, we want to witness to such a person. Yes, such a person's made in the image of God and really can't successfully live in, live in this world apart from God. Yes, such a person is under uh, the condemnation of God and has guilt and so forth. But there's no apologetical argument with such a person because such a person's purely arbitrary. All right. Well, then you're going to have another kind of answer. An answer that says... Well, because we have a great prophet who told us these things. That's the Confucian answer. They don't call him a prophet so much. He's a wise man. <clears throat> and you might think, oh, okay, now what do I do? I've got Jesus, they've got Confucius. Well, I've got Jesus, and Jesus provides the preconditions of intelligibility. I know it doesn't sound real warm and pious and uh, intimate to put it that way, but... We've talked about this. Jesus gives me a foundation for wisdom relative than foolishness. What does Confucius have going for him? What Confucius say? Here's what the nobleman did. The heavens declare this is what the nobleman is to do. Well, I have the right to say, well, Confucius, that's just your opinion. Back to number one, 
and that's rejected too because for everything Confucius said Buddha said something you know and for everything in the Bhagavad Gita you can find something that accounts that fits in with the Tao the fact that you have religious leaders or prophets or wise men or great people saying things doesn't mean that there's a good reason to follow what they're saying the difference between Christianity and Confucianism, Buddhism, and so forth is that Christianity's got an apologetic. We don't just arbitrarily choose Jesus over Confucius. We've got historical evidence. We've got philosophical evidence. We've got all kinds of reasons for believing what Jesus said. Not the least of which is our lives make sense and all the facts of history make sense within the Christian worldview taught by Jesus. That isn't true for Confucius. In fact, it gets really bad when you come to the Bhagavad Gita. Here's the Bhagavad Gita that many people say, well, they got their religious book, you Christians have your religious book. Oh, not so fast. I mean, that's what an amateur would say. If you've really done any reading or any study, it's a big mistake to put the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita in the same category. Why? In the first place, because the Bhagavad Gita doesn't claim that a personal, sovereign, all controlling God has spoken and this is the book that tells us what he said and you know why the Bhagavad Gita doesn't say that because it doesn't believe there's a personal holy sovereign God who can speak and so this book cannot be the result of God's revelation in the personal sense that the Bible is now, that doesn't mean the Bible is automatically right but don't think that the Bhagavad Gita is running in the same race with the Bible they're not doing the same thing at all Moreover, when you start comparing the Bhagavad Gita as a worldview and the Bible as a worldview, the Bhagavad Gita destroys the possibility of the comparison. Because you know, if the Bhagavad Gita is correct in what it says, there is no difference between it and the Bible. Oh, and by the way, not to, meant, not to overlook the obvious, there's no difference between you and the Bhagavad Gita either. There's no difference between you and the book and the earth and the sky and the trees and everything. We're all in this thing together. And none of the distinctions between sky and tree and stream and book and human being make any difference. Indeed, none of the distinctions between logically sound and logically unsound, morally good, morally bad, make any difference either. Oh no, it's a huge mistake to think the Bhagavad Gita is running in the same race with the Bible. The Bhagavad Gita undermines all logic and reasoning, all morality, all human personality, all human choice. So what do we have left? We have the arbitrary religions that say Confucius say, Buddha say, so forth, and say, yeah, everybody has an opinion. That's just arbitrary. You have the books that refute themselves, like the Bhagavad Gita. There's no rational basis for science or logic, given that worldview. And then you have one other class of religions. The only ones that really is of interest in this race for the preconditions of intelligibility. Materialists can't provide them. Dualists can't provide them. The vast majority, the vast majority of religions of the world can't provide them. But somebody says, well, what about the Muslims? Because they've got a personal God. They've got a revelation. They've got a book where it's recorded. What about the Mormons? What about people like that? And although in abstract, in terms of the general format or outline of what I'm presenting to you, you might think, okay, finally we've gotten to a good competitor. It turns out, at the point where we get a good competitor, we have the easiest way of dealing with them. How do you deal with those religions? You deal with them biblically. And the reason you deal with them biblically is because every one of them is committed to the Bible. There are no unique competitors with Christianity. The only ones that appear to give us a run for our money are all dependent upon our worldview. Did you know that? The Muslim faith is based on the Quran. The Quran itself endorses the Law of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Gospel of Jesus. Muhammad said that the Quran is nothing more but the end of the revelatory process that began way back in what we call the Bible. 
And so Muslims, if they are true to the Quran, and they must be because that's one of the pillars after all, Muhammad is the prophet of God, Muslims must be committed to the previous revelation of the Bible. And I'm not saying this is an easy thing. Indeed, psychologically and socially, culturally, it's a very hard thing. But logically, in terms of apologetical strategy, it's an easy thing to answer. How do you deal with the Muslim? You deal with the Muslim biblically. You go to the Quran and show that the Quran endorses the Bible. Then you go to the Bible and show that what the Quran says contradicts the Bible. So then on the Quran's own terms, you must reject the Quran. Let me run this past you slowly. I know time is out today, but I'll try to slowly do this. The Quran says God revealed himself, Allah revealed himself in Moses in the law. So we go back to the law, which is endorsed by the Quran. In the law, Moses says, any future prophet that comes along must be judged by the previous revelation that God has given. So the Quran sends us to Moses. Moses says you must judge the Quran or any other prophet by previous revelation. Then you point out that what the Quran reveals or claims to reveal is in conflict, indeed in dire conflict, with the law of Moses, the gospel of Jesus, and the Psalms of David. And so the Quran can be refuted on its own terms. How do they conflict? Well, time won't allow me to go into a full comparison at this point, but they conflict, first of all, in that according to the Quran, God cannot have a son. But according to the gospel of Jesus, God did have a son, and his name is Jesus. According to the Quran, people can be right with Allah, can be right with God, by doing good works. According to the law of Moses, nobody can be right with God. In fact, we come into this world dirty and filthy, and that's why circumcision was taught to the Jews. No one enters this world except through an organ that has to be cleansed in the eyes of God. And no one can be right with God without blood sacrifice. There's no blood sacrifice in the Quran. There's no need for blood atonement because your good works are to compensate for your bad works. And so in terms of their view of God and their view of salvation, Muslims stand in utter contradiction to the teaching of Moses and David and Jesus. And so once again, the internal critique of Islam is it rests upon the Bible, it says, and so you can go to the Bible to refute the Quran. How about Mormons? You say, what do you do with Mormons? Because they're not like Muslims, a different religion. They're some kind of version of Christian. Yeah, but Mormons will all tell you what? That the Bible is their book. And the Book of Mormon is just what? The capstone of the Bible. It's just another revelation the Christians have left out. Well, but if they honor the Bible and the Book of Mormon, then you can argue with them by comparing the Bible and the Book of Mormon to show that the Book of Mormon conflicts with the Bible. Now, what will Muslims and Mormons and all the rest, well, there aren't that many, but in this narrow category of religions that ape Christianity, what will they do once you point out the Bible conflicts with their revelation or putative revelation? It never fails. They'll turn around and say, well, then you don't have the right Bible. Right? <laughs> The Muslims will say the Bible's been corrupted and that in its original form it really did agree with the Quran. Number one. The only reason Muslims say that the Bible has been corrupted is because it conflicts with the Quran. They have no evidence of such corruption, no history of such corruption. They say, oh, you Christians, you tampered with it. Have you ever known somebody to accuse another person of his own sin? Takes one to know one? You know why Muslims think Christians corrupted the Bible in that way? Of course, there's no evidence that they did. Is that as a matter of fact, the version of the Quran that we have today arises from a recension of the textual evidence in the third caliphate of Uthman. They called in all the conflicting texts and burned them upon pain of death. So maybe since they've done that, they think we've done the same thing. But there is no evidence. This arises only from prejudicial conjunction. There's no argument here. It's just you must be wrong because we must be right. The Mormons, 
will tell us, well, the Bible's been corrupted and you really need the interpretation of Joseph Smith. Yeah, but Joseph Smith's the only one who saw the plates and only one given the miraculous ability to translate them. And about this Joseph Smith, you should keep in mind that he's been twice convicted, and we know this, of being a con man in the state of New York. The con man became the prophet of God who tells us he alone has seen the gold plates and knows how to translate them. And we should all now give up the public evidence of the Bible for this? It's asking too much for anybody to be reasonable in that way. Very quickly at the end here of our session, what I'm getting at is even those religions that ape Christianity can be dealt with in terms of an internal critique of what they say. And so I think presuppositionalism is not only a strong, indeed the strongest argument for Christianity, it can deal with all comers as well. And we'll continue tomorrow.